cases argued and determined in the United States Court of Appeals, United States Court of Customs and Patent Appeals, and United States Emergency Court of Appeals. Copyright 1957 by West Publishing Company. Oh, let's see here. That's the second, first circuit. Sixth Circuit, Seventh Circuit, Eighth Circuit, Ninth Circuit, Tenth Circuit, and then we have the United States Court of Customs and Patent Appeals, United States Emergency Court of Appeals, United States Court of Claims, United States Customs Court, and all the cases. Thompson Chemical Corporation. Okay. And patent infringement action defendants on top plaintiff enjoined from commencing or further prosecuting similar suits against defendants. Pending determination of the patent, the patent infringement action. Okay, here we have the courts. Here, where defendant in patent infringement action in federal district court in California intervened in patent infringement suit in federal district court in Washington against its customers and obtained an order staying the proceedings in the Washington suit. Defendant had no standing to seek the identical relief in the California case. Where defendant in patent infringement suit in federal district court of California intervened in two patent infringement suits in federal district courts in Washington against its customers and moved in each for an order staying proceedings pending disposition of the California action and a stay was denied. In the second Washington case, the court erred in granting a stay in the California case to restrain further prosecution of the second Washington Um, here we have the patents section. A patent owner has a cause of action separate and independent from that against an infringing manufacturer to recover profits and damages and to restrain one who resells a product which he purchased from an infringing manufacturer. Okay, now this is from the U.S. court. Ninth Circuit, March 29th, 1957. Okay. Injunction. Under certain circumstances, a patent owner who has already brought an infringement suit against a manufacturer may be enjoined from commencing other infringement suits against customers of the manufacturer pending disposition of initial litigation. And such an injunction may be granted without substantial impairment of the plaintiff's rights. Under patent law, it will operate to prevent needless litigation. In the courts section, right here. Down there. Uh, in absence of finding a patent infringement suit, 
that defendant was financially responsible and an absence of evidence on which such a finding could be made. Order enjoining plaintiff from commencing similar suits against defendant or its customers. Pending determination of the infringement action was improper. Oh, pending. Stone versus United States. SF Brothers for uh, SF Brothers Company versus Wisebot. See this bankruptcy. SF Brothers Company bankrupt to see Pallant. Walter G. Walter G. Wiseman is the trustee in bankruptcy of the Lee. Number one two nine five five. United States Courts of Appeals, Sixth Circuit, March 26, 1957. This is a bankruptcy proceeding. I think we can maybe see about that one. That would be number two. SF Brothers Company, number two. S. the trustee in bankruptcy. Court of Appeals, Sixth Circuit. And the date on that was normal March 26th, 1957. Okay. Bankruptcy proceeding. The United States District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan, Southern Division, 151F, Sub 153. Frank A. Picard, J., entered order approving compromise settlement entered into by trustee in bankruptcy with the claimant and bankrupt, and bankrupt appealed. The Court of Appeals held that there was no abuse of discretion in approval of settlement of litigation involving many conflicting claims. And it was affirmed in Section 1.
Let's see here. It may be disturbed only when it clearly appears that such discretion has been abused. I make a note of that. Section Such discretion has been abused. Okay. Section two, bankruptcy. In bankruptcy proceeding, approval of compromise settlement entered into by trustee. In bankruptcy with a claimant who had pending litigation with the bankrupt involving many conflicting claims was not shown to have been an abuse of discretion. Fred B. Collier, Royal Oak, Michigan, on brief of her appellant. Benjamin D. Jaffe, Detroit, Michigan. Aaron Weiswasser, Detroit, Michigan, of counsel. Weiswasser, Jaffe, and Radner, Detroit, Michigan, on brief for Apolli. For Sullivan's chief judge and Allen and McAllister circuit judges. Per curiam, the issue in this case is whether there was an abuse of discretion by the referee in bankruptcy and the district court in approving a compromise settlement. The compromise was entered into by the trustee in bankruptcy with the claimant and a depending litigation with the bankrupt in the district court. Uh, Title 11, USCA Section Section 27 of the Bankruptcy Act provides that the receiver or trustee may, with the approval of the court, compromise any controversy arising in the administration of the estate upon such terms as he may deem for the best interest of the estate. The evidence disclosed that the litigation which was pending against the bankrupt at the time of his bankruptcy involved many conflicting claims. The district court was aware of the nature of the litigation. As the district judge who approved the compromise had heard much of the evidence in the case between the claimant, the claimant and the bankrupt during a two-week period of the trial prior to the adjudication of bankruptcy, during which the claimant had introduced its evidence into detail. The district court, therefore, had obviously ascertained the nature and extent of the claim against the bankrupt. An order approving a compromise of a doubtful claim involves the discretionary powers of the court it may be disturbed only when it clearly appears that such discretion had been, has been abused. And that comes from... That comes from Scott V. Jones. From the Tenth Circuit. Right there. I have to make a note of that as well. I'll have to go look at that a little bit further. Scott. Number 
Code 4744, the United States Courts of Appeal, Court of Appeals 9th Circuit. So it's Donald M. Wallman v. USA, number 147. U.S. Court of Appeals, Ninth Circuit, May 2nd, 1957. Okay. Now let's see. The defendant was convicted of refusal to answer questions before a congressional committee and from a judgment in the United States District Court for the District of George H. Bolt, J. Defendant appealed. The United States Courts of, Court of Appeals, Chambers, Circuit Judge, held defendant was not entitled to refuse to answer questions as to his residence, employment, and education on the ground that he was afraid of reprisals to his family and was not going to be a stool pigeon and might waive his rights. Judgment affirmed. Section 1 of the United States. An indictment charging witness with refusal to answer a question before a congressional committee with respect to his residence was not insufficient on the ground that the indictment did not plead or prove the pertinency of the question. Section 2. The test of pertinency of a question before the congressional committee is not whether the question itself is in the ultimate area of investigation, which was the communistic activities in the Pacific Northwest state. The question is pertinent if the question is the usual and necessary tone in the arch of the bridge over which an investigation must go. Section 3. Witnesses. A trial judge is entitled to decide and tell the jury whether the defendant had the right to claim the constitutional privilege against incrimination which the defendant asserts. USCA Constitutional Amendment 5. Witnesses. Section 4. The prosecution for refusal to answer questions before a congressional committee respecting communistic activities wherein defendant claimed the Fifth Amendment, defendant at the committee interrogation, or at no later than trial, must demonstrate how the question might be dangerous for him to answer. An attempt of defendant to import a committee hearing report containing the testimony of earlier witnesses testifying as to communistic underground activities was improper. And the collateral, the collateral record would not be considered. USCA Constitutional Amendment 5. Section 5 is witnesses 293 and a half and 297. Under the privilege against self-incrimination, it is only a direct defense of the crime that a defendant does not have to be sworn and take the stand. And within the ter territorial limits of jurisdiction, a witness must respond to a subpoena and take the stand for grand jury and congressional investigations and ordinarily must state his name. USCA Constitutional Amendment 5. And section 6 is witnesses 307. A witness testifying before a congressional committee and claiming the Fifth Amendment would not be entitled to refuse to testify as to his residence unless the disclosure of his address would lead to incrimination. And if such is the case, it ought to be pointed out somewhere before the case goes to the jury, or the possibility should appear to the trial court in the record it had. Section 7. That's the United States. In prosecution for refusal to answer questions before a congressional committee, indictment was not insufficient for failure to allege that the refusal to answer the question was willful. Section 8. That's the United States. In prosecution for refusal to answer a question before a congressional committee respecting residents' employment and education, question of defendant's intentional refusal to answer was properly submitted to the jury. Hmm. Section 9. The United States. In prosecution for refusing to answer questions before a congressional committee, record established that the committee chairman properly instructed the defendant to answer. Section 10, United States again. 
and prosecution for refusal to answer questions before a congressional committee. The defendant was not entitled to refuse to answer questions as to his residence, employment, and education on the ground that he was afraid of reprisals to his family. He was not going to be a stool pigeon in my way of his rights. Let's see here. For this particular case, sections one and two, one, two, seven through ten relate to the United States, and then sections three, four. Three through six relate to witnesses. These are for witnesses number three, four, five, six. Just those four. Okay. Three, four, five, six. This is Wallum, that one was Wallman. Riker versus Commissioner of Internal Revenue. Peggy Lou Riker and Frida H. Grassmi. Appellants. Commissioner of Internal Revenue. This is the Ninth Circuit. April 12, 1957, and a rehearing was denied on June 17, 1957. information on this one. <laughs> Yawn, the United States. James William Yawn. <laughs> I like that name. Uh, Barkey Importing Company. A little bit of information on that one as well. Valley Barge Line, the T.L. James and Company, Mississippi Valley Barge Line. Okay, we have two numbers here, 16469 and 16470. Mississippi Valley. for that. Number 16469 and 16470. Okay, now this is the United States Court of Appeals, Fifth Circuit, May 3rd, 19. Alright, let's see what we have here. 
Restrictions arising out of sinking of barge and loss of cargo. A barge was being towed by carrier. The United States District Court for the Eastern District of Louisiana, Judge Skelly Wright, uh, rendered decree imposing liability on carrier for damages for negligent towage. The carrier appealed. The Court of Appeals, adjacent chief judge, held that under the circumstances, the contract was one of towage and not a freightment. And this was affirmed. The first two sections relate to towage. Release from liability for negligence clause, which was incorporated in towage contract and carrier's tariff, was invalid and did not receive did not relieve carrier from liability in connection with the sinking of barge while in tow of carrier. And then section two is also towage. Contract by carrier providing for the moving of barge not owned by carrier, together with cargo stored therein, constituted a contract for towage services and not one of a freightment. And carrier was liable for its negligence, which caused the sinking of the barge while in tow of carrier. Harder Act, Section 3, 46 USCA, Section 192. Interstate Commerce Act, Section 301 at SEC, 49 USCA, Section 901 at SEC. Hutchison was the chief judge, and Tuttle and Jones were the circuit judges. Hutchison, chief judge. These two appeals from judgments and related actions arising out of the sinking of the LaBelle and consolidated for trial. Present for our decision, two primary, present for our decision, two, two, two primary questions. One, whether the district judge correctly held that the sinking was due to the negligence and fault of the appellant. The other, if so, whether the appellant was entitled to invoke the exoneration afforded by Section 3 of the Harder Act and the defensive clauses of the Bill of Lading. So two issues here. The answer to the first question depends merely upon an appraisement of the facts and evidence. The answer to the second question depends on whether the transportation involved was carriage or towage whether, if it was carriage, Valley was entitled under the circumstances to invoke Section 3 of the Harder Act. The overall answers to both questions depend upon whether the district judge was correct in his determination of fact and of laws as to Valley's liability in connection with the sinking of the barge. This is the origin of the two actions. In December of 1954, T.L. James and Company Incorporated, here and after called James, engaged in the general contracting and construction business with offices in Houston, Texas, in Kenner, Louisiana, and Mississippi Valley Barge Line Company, hereafter called Valley. A common carrier by water, which holds an Interstate Commerce Commission certificate, entered into an agreement that Valley would transport the barge of the bill, supplied and loaded by James, the bulldozer and other miscellaneous contractors' equipment from New Orleans, Louisiana to Cheatham Dam, Tennessee for an agreed-upon charge and would return the barge to New Orleans empty without charge. En route, the barge careened and dumped its load and then sank in the Mississippi River, thereby precipitating this litigation. It was initiated by a suit at law filed by Valley against James for the freight money and the federal transportation tax due thereon for transporting the cargo of contractors' equipment pursuant to a provision in Valley's tariff on file with the Interstate Commerce Commission for the collection and payment of the transportation charges, notwithstanding the fact that the cargo was lost en route. Subsequently, James, as bareboat charterer of the Barge LaBelle, sued in admiralty, in admiralty for its damages allegedly incurred because of the sinking of the barge, and James, together with Brown and Root Incorporated, doing business under the name of Louisiana Bridge Company, here and after called Shippers, alleging that they were the owners of the contractor's equipment laden on the barge LaBelle, joined in this admiralty action, claiming the damages allegedly sustained by them as such cargo owners resulting from the sinking of the barge. Valley filed a 56 rule petition against James alleging that James had warranted that the barge LaBelle was seaworthy 
When the cargo properly stowed thereon, it demanded that in the event, Valley be held liable for loss of or damage to the barge lapel or its cargo due to uns unseaworthiness of the barge or improper storage of cargo thereon. Valley be awarded a decree for a similar amount over against James. I see here. I guess I don't need this section. settled against it in the Biso case, and that is pointed out in the opinion of the district judge below, and in the briefs of the appellees, appellees here, appellees here, the fact that this illegal clause is embodied in a tariff cannot make it legal. Section 2. Upon the crucial question whether the contract was and was intended to be one of towage rather than of a freightment, we are of the clear opinion that no other reasonable view can be taken the evidence than that the district the, the district court took. The fact that both the oral agreement and its written confirmations provided for moving the barge, the fact that nothing was said at the time of the contract about the matters now so strongly urged, that the agreement was not one of towage but one of affrightment, and the fact that the bill of lading was not issued until some time after the loss, not only tend strongly, we think, to support, but also to compel the view that the parties were not for a freightment, but for a towage service, and that the district judge was right in so holding. Let's see. It still swift. the estate of Henry Wilbur Fox, deceased, plaintiff Eppley, versus Hay Freight Lines, Hayes Freight Lines, Incorporated, U.S. Court of Appeals, Seventh Circuit, May 22nd, 1957. We're going to make that one number successful attempt to 
to start another of defendant's trucks by pushing same on the highway. The United States District Court for the Southern District of Indiana, Indianapolis Division, William E. Steckler, Chief Judge, entered judgment for plaintiff and defendant appealed. The Court of Appeals, Duffy, Chief Judge, held that evidence including testimony as to lack of lights on defendant's truck and distance of truck from burning PC placed on road, fuse presented a question for the jury as to plaintiff's contributory negligence in running into defendant's vehicle, and it was affirmed. Section 1 deals with automobiles. In action for personal injuries and death sustained when an automobile operated by plaintiff collided head-on with one of the defendant's trucks, which had stopped on the highway during the nighttime after an unsuccessful effort to start another of defendant's trucks by pushing same. Evidence, including testimony as to lack of lights on defendant's truck and distance of truck from burning fuse placed on road, presented a question for the jury as to plaintiff's contributory negligence in running into defendant's vehicle. Section 2 is negligence. Under Indiana, Indiana law, contributory negligence ordinarily is a question of fact for jury and only in cases where the facts are undisputed and but a single inference can be drawn therefrom. Uh, can reviewing courts say that a course of conduct does or does not constitute contributory negligence as a matter of law? Section 3 is damages. Award of $25,000 to a 49-year-old woman who suffered a broken left kneecap, a cut to the right kneecap, three broken ribs, a deep laceration in the chin requiring 12 or 13 stitches, sprained right ankle, multiple bruises scattered over her body, and a slight pneumothorax, and who was in the hospital for 30 days under constant medical care, and whose kneecap was surgically repaired with a permanent wire suture, who still suffered pain two years after the accident, with no power from her hip to her knee and the left leg, and had difficulty lifting because of chest pains, was not excessive. was generous, but we cannot say that there was any abuse of the trial court's discretion because it did not set the verdict aside, and in our judgment, the award was not grossly excessive. So there she was awarded and we hold that the trial court did not come to error in giving that instruction and the judgment was affirmed. Okay. okay, I think that will do it for today. I've got some good notes. 